everyone, and welcome to uh, Or and Born with Teeth at the Santa Fe Playhouse. My name's James, my pronouns are he and him, and I'm the scenic designer for this production. What you're seeing on the screen right now are four separate renderings. Um, the two on the left are renderings of what the open stage looks like for the production of Or, and on the right is what the stage looks like for the production of Born with Teeth. As you can see, these two shows share a general surround. In doing that, we, the design team and the directors, we had to uh, discover and investigate what married these two shows together. And the an answer was fairly obvious. These two shows are about writers. Uh, Born with Teeth is about William Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe, and Orr is about Afra Ben. Now, there are a couple of things that I want to point out that that we're using to show some distinction between the two shows. So I'm gonna start over here on the left with the production of Orr. This production takes place in Afra Ben's um, rented flat in London. There's gonna be some additional furniture here that's not depicted in the, in the rendering. Her writing desk, some chairs, maybe a couple of seats that are sprinkled throughout the space. The stage right door goes off to her bedroom, the stage left door here, it uh, goes down to the entry, and then in the center there is this uh, sort of bureau cabinet situation. There's some stage tricks that happen with that that I'm not going to spoil. Um, now to, to switch over to our production of Born With Teeth, there's a couple of things that we do. The first thing that we do is we move this um, center cupboard to behind the set and turn it into a bay window. And then downstage of that is a large table. This play takes place in the back room of a tavern, basically a rented sort of conference room in the 17th century. Um, so this table and the stools are what help depict that. And then we cover up the doors. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the whole surround. Our directors have been kind enough to write up a whole bunch of wonderful text about these three writers, and we are sprinkling that across the stage. The walls are literally parchment uh, covered as though they are written from the imaginations of, of maybe the production team or maybe these characters or maybe the directors, um, however the audience wants to interpret that. Um, so all of the letters and all of the wording on um, the walls is, is, is real. It's, um, it's actual words that were written by our team. In the past, we used to create physical models um, that uh, we would give to the rehearsal room so they could really look um, and see what the sta stage is going to look like just in a smaller scale. Nowadays, we use 3D software to help design and communicate what everything is going to look like. And that's what I have here. Um, so we have drafted and put into 3D space the entire set for both Or and Born With Teeth. In this case, we are looking at Born With Teeth, but I'm able to share this with all of the rest of the design team, like the costume designer and the lighting designer and the props and set decorators, so they all really understand the color and the layout of the stage. This helps them create a more effective design. Now, in addition to these 3D elements, we also have to communicate all of this information to the people building the set. Um, and we do that through drawings um, that look a lot like architecture drawings. So I'm going to go to a couple of those. So we start out with our floor plan. This showcases in scale um, the layout of all of the furniture and all of the walls. It showcases the direction of the doors. Every, we're trying to communicate everything that somebody might need to know um, about the placement of all of the elements. We do that for each of the different productions. Um, and then we go into the front elevations of the wall. So we're depicting exactly what all of the elements on the stage looks like down to the quarter inch. In addition to communicating with the people that are gonna build the show, we have to communicate to painters who are gonna paint the show. Um, and we do that through color elevations. So each one of these elements has a complete color elevation, even down to what the masking wall and what the colors of that is. All of that stuff is um, very considered and uh, communicated as best we can to 
everybody that's involved with the production. Um, anyway, that's all I have for you now. I really hope you come and see the show, and I really hope you in, uh, enjoy the process of creating theater, um, because uh, we sure do at the Santa Fe Playhouse. Um, anyway, thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Renee Jordan, and I'm the costume designer for Santa Fe Playhouse production of Or and Born with Teeth. Happy first rehearsal. I'm looking forward to working with all of you. And to that end, I'd like to share my designs with you. Let's start with Or. While the script gives us some latitude to blend the modern and the historical, Zoe and I have decided to lean into the period aspects of this production, allowing the costumes to help ground the audience in the 17th century. This is the story of Afro Ben, a playwright, poet, political spy, and smasher of glass ceilings. She broke cultural barriers and served as a literary role model for generations of female authors to come, and was one of the first women to earn her living by writing. Afro will be played by the lovely and talented Brashawn Joyner. All the rest of the characters will be played by one of our two other immensely dexterous company members, Chloe Carson or Patrick Jansen. Therefore, I have designed their looks to help define each unique character, as well as facilitate their various transformations. At the top of the show, we see Afra in a debtor's prison. While she would have been wearing clothing commensurate with her social status, we wanted to highlight her captivity and have chosen to show her in a hooded cloak. Here, along with her jailer, one of the lowest status characters in the show, we are introduced to our heroine as well as her plight. The jailer is dressed in a simple ensemble, dark in color and coarse in texture. His head will be covered with a coif or a woolen cap. A leather belt and a dark shirt will round out this ensemble. Next, our heroine is visited by a disguised King Charles II. Charles was a fashion icon with a very specific historical style. His time in France and the continent influenced his fashion choices, and upon his ascension to the throne, brings with him a period known as Restoration. The Restoration period marked a transition in fashion from the doublet and petticoat breeches to the adoption of the coat and knee breeches that would dominate men's fashion for over a century. Charles was known for his long flowing brown locks and his elaborate lace collars and cravats. He's dressed opulently in shades of royal blue velvet trimmed with gold. Once Afra has been sprung from debtor's prison, we see her beginning to write in her newly established rooms. This is where we get our first glance of her real ensemble. The dresses of the Cavalier or Restoration period had pointed bodices with stiff decorative stomachers and fuller skirts. Sleeves were large and gathered at the wrist or elbow, often with turned back lace cuffs. Afra's dress is brightly colored, yet simple as befits her state. A classic, elegant ensemble, but not overly ornate. One of Afra's first visitors is Nell Gwynn. As an actor, Nell appears in an ensemble not typical for ladies of the period. She comes to Afra's quarters disguised as a young man, replete with a doublet suit and a shirt that both conceals and hints at her gender. In an effort to embrace her androgyny, we have chosen a palette of light blues and lavenders for the character of Nell. The next character to come bursting into Afra's quarters is William Scott. Also masked and sporting a look typical of the musketeers of the period, William is a bit of a rogue and a swashbuckler. He's dressed in shades of brown, slate, and gray with a flowing cloak and leather accents, as well as an oversized hat typical of the period. Lady Davenant is a wealthy widow and Afra's patron. She has decided to use her late husband's fortune to support the arts, and specifically our heroine Afra. Her palette is dark and luxurious, and she dons a long lace veil as a sign of her extended mourning. And finally, we come to Mariah, Afra's loyal maid. Mariah is a comic character to be sure, but her ensemble mimics the silhouette of her ladies in a much simpler and more streamlined fashion. Her color palette is cool but vibrant, and she is full of textures that help define her status as a working class woman. Mariah will also be wearing an apron and a close fitting bonnet or a mop cap. Moving on to our next production, Born with Teeth. 
Born with Teeth is a show about life and love under an authoritarian rule that turns preconceived notions on its head as we explore the relationship between two of the greatest playwrights of all times, William Shakespeare and Kit Marlowe. This show is about two historical figures whom we thought we knew and understood, but Liz Duffy Adams gives us license to imagine them through a different light. For this production, we wanted to blend period and modern aesthetics, taking elements from the historical and mashing them up with a contemporary vibe. Period doublets mixed with a classic and modern elements like jeans, motorcycle boots, and flowy romantic billowy shirts. These characters were the rock stars of their generation, and we are playing with styles that give each one a unique sense of personality and identity. Christopher Kit Marlowe was the more established of the two playwrights. Having enjoyed many successful productions, he starts the show with an opulent look to him. We see his success reflected in his apparel. He has a bit of a swagger to him and preens like a peacock. There is a touch of the glam rock vibe to him. Taking inspiration from fashion icons like Bowie and Jagger, Kit's look will play with a combination of the soft and the hard, embracing luxurious fabrics, splendid silhouettes and patterns, as well as the glamour of expensive jewelry and accessories. Marlowe starts the show by bursting into the scene with a swoosh of his cape and commanding the attention of the room. As the story progresses, we start to see the breaking down of this pomp and artifice, and we see Kit's character begin to share some intimate thoughts, ideas, and even moments with his young writing partner. As the character begins to become more vulnerable, we loosen the doublet, showing a glimpse of what lies within. Eventually, we start to see the disintegration of Marlowe's status as he finds his life has become enveloped in more and more chaos. This softer and more exposed look is reflected in a similar transformation of his costume as he becomes more and more disheveled. By scene three, he is just in his shirt sleeves. All of the artifice has been stripped away. As we contemplate Marlowe's character arc, we must also consider the equal and opposite arc of the character of the young Will Shakespeare. Shakespeare is the greener playwright. He has started to see successes, but is not as sophisticated as the wealthy kid. He is a more simple silhouette, and to this end, we have decided to mix his character's look with a more rock and roll aesthetic. Will starts out the show very buttoned up and proper reflective of his country lifestyle in Stratford. He has financial obligations that necessitate a level of economy in his life and style. With Will, we are playing with textures and patterns in a more subdued color palette, possibly adding in elements like leather and metal to help give his look a harder edge. As the show goes on, Will's confidence builds. In scene two, he starts to loosen up and grow into his newfound status. And we see Will's look become more chill doublet unbuttoned, a hint of softer and more modern shirt, sexier with a touch more personality. To start scene three, we see elements of the outside world creep into the back room of this tavern where our characters are meeting to continue to work on their scripts. The plague has taken grip on London, something we can all relate to, unfortunately, and Will arrives in a plague doctor ensemble, complete with a mask, long coat and headpiece, this ensemble would have protected the wearer from disease, as well as serving to disguise his identity. By the third scene, we see a shift in the power dynamic, and Will is starting to enjoy some success as an author. He changes into a new fancier doublet, as Marlowe starts to unravel, both mentally and visually. I can't wait to see how you each bring these characters to life. I'm excited to go on this journey with you. See you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Hi, my name is Colby Clark, he, him. I'm the lighting designer for our two shows, Or and Born with Teeth. Starting with Or, lighting will take us through three specific times or places. We'll start in the cold, shadowy debtor's prison, where lighting will give our actors and these characters the chance to move in and out of the light. This is then followed by the, the warmth, the, the candlelit evening and night at Affer's Lodging. The chaos of the night will take place, ultimately leading through the dawn as the new day comes in, fresh light on the scene as these characters experience the resolution of the story. With Born With Teeth, we'll have the opportunity to play with a few different styles. Starting with the torture scene, there'll be rays of light, sharp texture. 
will then move to the tavern scenes. In the tavern scenes, they'll, they'll largely be treated with realism, but perhaps with a few pops of color in the background. The real fun takes place between, as we transition from, from one scene to the next, lighting will go along with the music and incorporate ideas of punk or glam rock as the scenes go along. Uh, the final scene then blends these worlds, the, the realism of the tavern, but some of these rock or punk ideas. Um, as Will takes the victory lap in the final monologue, think spotlights and very bold colors. I look forward to creating with you all. Hello, uh, I am Jorge Olivo. I'm the sound designer on both these shows, and I'm going to show you some of the sounds that I'm making for it. Um, for Or, we're doing uh, sort of a more cinematic vibe, and we're doing some more guitar-y stuff. Uh, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play you some sounds. So that's sort of the vibe for uh, or um, sort of leaning into guitar things and cinematic -y things. Um, and then for Born With Teeth, uh, we're going for more of a rock vibe, uh, which has been really fun for me because I started learning guitar during the pandemic. So this is a chance to do some guitar stuff and have fun with that. Um, and here is some of that. And also trying to combine uh, orchestral instruments, uh, strings, and different things with uh, rock beats. Um, maybe sneak some of that into either uh, one of the two shows. Um, yeah, and that's that's what I got so far. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting everyone in person and working on the show with y'all. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm very excited. Uh, have fun uh, on the first reading today. Hi, my name is Emily Rankin. I use she, her pronouns, and I will be serving as the props designer. I'm sorry that I can't be there with all of you in person, but I so look forward to collaborating with all of you on both of these stories. And because both of these stories are centered around writers and writing, uh, let's talk about writing in both the 1590s uh, with Born With Teeth and in the 1660s to 1670s with ore. Now, the printing press was invented in the 1440s, so actual bound books did exist at this time. But of course, as a writer, you're most often writing something on paper um, yourself by hand. Uh, now, in other parts of the world, the most popular writing tools were papyrus reeds, but in Europe, the most popular writing tool at this time was the goose feather quill, which was a goose feather that was shaped 
uh, with a small knife into a calligraphy point and then was dipped in ink from an inkwell and then you would use that to write on your paper, which was most often made of parchment or sometimes vellum, which was a dried and treated animal skin. And once you had written uh, what you wanted to write on your paper, you would grab your pounce pot, which was a little shaker filled with salt or sand that you would sprinkle over the paper to dry the ink and keep it from smearing. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just so excited to sort of dive in and, and share this research with all of you. Um, I think it's, uh, it's so incredible, both of these stories, um, to, to think about, you know, these words that were written hundreds of years ago that we still have access to today and these ideas that have been passed down to us for so many years. Um, and that's something that's really exciting to me and uh, that we get to continue these stories um, and share them with each other and with our audience is something that I really look forward to collaborating with you on. Um, and I can't wait to dive in. Thanks so much. Hi there, my name is Adi Cabral. I am working on OR and Born With Teeth as the Intimacy Director and Dialect Coach. As dialect coach, I work with the actors to perform regionally specific accents, knowing that Or and Born With Teeth are both set in the UK, working with the actors to find what is the regionally specific sound for each one of their characters. Um, as intimacy director, I work with the director and actors to use a consent-based trauma-informed approach to performing on-stage intimacy that may be simulated romance, or that might even be what is the intimacy between friends. So we'll be working with the actors throughout the process to make sure that they are confident, comfortable, and sustainable in the work that they do to tell the stories that you're gonna see on stage. Excited to be a part of this project and looking forward to seeing it come to fruition. Hope you all have a great first read through. Take care.